A nation thrives when the people are Christian. And research supports this. Intrinsic religiosity in a Christian population has been shown to lead to more pro-social behavior, self-control, charity work, and more stable political systems. So why shouldn't we promote Christian nationalism? Let's define our nation around Christianity, pass laws based on Christian ethics, and build a nation on Christian values. After all, Christian nationalism is about protecting the nation with Christian values, so Christians can thrive and preach the gospel. Surely every Christian should want this. The moral corruption we see in our current secular society has been detrimental in multiple ways. The more we become a post-Christian society, the more moral deterioration we experience. Why not pave a path forward with Christian nationalism? A return to Christian principles and Christian ethics. What could possibly go wrong? Christianity has declined in the West, and what has replaced it is secularism. More and more we are becoming a secular world where Christianity has little influence on the government or culture. And the response to this by some has been to promote Christian nationalism. Christianity cannot thrive and grow because we no longer have a culture that fosters Christian values. If Christians can gain political power and influential positions over the culture, we can shift the nation back towards Christian values. The goal must be to transform the nation away from secularism and enforce Christian principles. This will reverse the decline of Christianity and encourage more to become Christian. But this will never work. The goal of Christian nationalists is well-intended, but misguided. I agree a nation is better when the people are Christian, but we cannot make a nation more Christian through politics or a culture war. You can only make a nation Christian through evangelism. Christianity is not a political system or a culture. When you try to weaponize Christianity to be something it was never intended to be, you will always lose. It's like fighting fire with fire. When Christianity is meant to be water, the forest will burn around us and all will suffer because of it. When we try to make Christianity a culture, whether a politically left or right-leaning culture, we end up reducing the strength of the gospel to transform lives. The focus becomes on changing one's politics, not their heart. Jesus gave the Great Commission, not the Great Culture War. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All nations are called to declare Christ King, not by force, but willingly surrendering to Him. Notice Jesus said all authority on heaven and earth had been given to Him. He is now King of the whole world, and if He wanted, He could call down legions of angels to enforce His laws. But He doesn't. If Christian nationalism was the way forward for us, then why doesn't Jesus take this path? Why didn't he teach his followers to get a hold of positions in government and enforce his laws to foster an environment built on values he wants? Wouldn't this make the world better? Perhaps for a little while, but in the long run it would be detrimental. It would not create a people that freely love and give their lives to Christ, but an enslaved people. They would worship him because they have to not because they want to. Prohibition was built on good intentions. Let's ban alcohol, so men stop wasting money on drinking and stop going home drunk and hitting their wives. But prohibition didn't make anyone more moral. It only created new forms of crime, underground bars, and criminal organizations that wreaked havoc. Attempting to make people moral through governmental force did not work. And we only need to study history to see that this is true. Christian nationalism teaches it would be better if Christians seized positions in government and the culture and then forced our values on the rest of the world. But nowhere do we see Christ preaching this is the way. In fact, this very idea is what Satan tempted Christ with. Do not create a mission to save the world one heart at a time, but allow the devil to give you the tools and power to forcibly make the world in the image you want it to be. Before Jesus started his mission, he had to deal with the enemy the old defeated king of the world. Jesus declared at his baptism for all the powers of darkness to see that he was the Messiah. And then he went into the wilderness to begin the war. After 40 days of fasting, Satan first tempted Jesus to turn stones into bread. 
a simple temptation that seemed reasonable. Why should Jesus not be sustained? After all, he is the Messiah and fasted long enough. He ought to use his power to satisfy his needs. None of us would think it unreasonable if a starving man was given the power to turn rocks into bread and then acted upon his new abilities. Satan's temptation is subtle. The Father had sent Jesus out into the wilderness and was not providing for him. So the Son should take matters into his own hands and provide for himself. In other words, do not wait on God to act, but seize power and provide for yourself what you need. But Jesus did not fall to the temptation. It was not for him to decide the course of the future, but for the Father to decide when Jesus was to eat. Man should not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. It was the will of the Father that Jesus rely on God's word and not act on his own for self-gratification, regardless of the suffering he experienced. You see, Jesus never called us to do anything he did not already experience. And thus, Jesus resisted the first temptation of the devil to seize power apart from the plan of God. But this was merely the devil testing his opponent. Satan then took him to the top of the temple and said, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. A common understanding is this is a temptation to test God's care for Jesus. Surely if Jesus is the Son of God, then the Father should protect him at all costs. Satan was perhaps trying to stir doubt in the mind of Jesus. He ought to prove to himself God really loves him by protecting him from death. Jesus, of course, resisted the temptation, but there is more going on besides testing God's care. This is another temptation of power. Notice they are in a public area where all would have seen them. If this was merely about testing the Father's protection, any mountain cliff would suffice. But if Jesus were to throw himself off the temple and be rescued by angels that placed him safely on the ground, the crowds of Jerusalem would have immediately worshipped him as God's anointed. There would be no doubt that this man was the Messiah. And perhaps a later rabbinic source might be related to this. The rabbi said they had a tradition handed down to them that when the Messiah would appear, he would stand on the roof of the temple and say to Israel, The time of your redemption has come. Satan is not merely tempting Jesus to test God's care, but offering him the Jewish nation. Instead of resisting Jesus, Satan will freely give God's chosen people to him. It is an offer to take the easy road. Instead of debating with the Pharisees and scribes for years, instead of the Jewish leaders working to have him killed and accusing him of working for Beelzebub, the devil will give Jesus a nation that will back his cause and allow it to foster and grow unchallenged. But Jesus refused. Having the nation handed over to him would not create a kingdom of souls built by those who freely choose to follow him. The only way forward for the kingdom was one of suffering, strife, and pain. The third temptation is similar to the second, but instead, Satan offered Jesus all the kingdoms of the world. If the Jewish nation was not enough, Jesus could have it all, as long as he agreed to worship the devil. But Satan is offering Jesus something that was already his. After the resurrection, Jesus said all authority in heaven and on earth had been given to him. Jesus had every right to rule the nations and would be given them. But Satan is again offering the easy way. Forget the crucifixion. Forget the slow and painful process of building a church. He will give Jesus the nations, and the people will declare him king now. But again, Jesus refuses. We know Jesus had to refuse to bow to Satan, but this option was still available to him through a different route. Jesus said he had legions of angels at his disposal. At any point, Jesus could have seized the power he needed to take the easy way to rulership. Instead, Jesus chose a path of suffering. But why? Because using political force will never transform humanity from a depraved, sinful race into a glorified race. The way we transform lives is through the message of the gospel, not forcing our values onto others. All must be willing to follow Christ, not be forced to. Christianity does not need worldly powers or institutions to grow. Our mission is a heavenly one, not an earthly one. The lie of Christian nationalism is that we need earthly powers to save the church. 
Her mission must first be political. But this is what Satan offered Jesus. Take the political and cultural road to growing your kingdom. Seize the nations, and with that power, you can make Christianity supreme. But our Lord set an example for us by rejecting this. And if we want to transform the world for His glory, we must also. Christian nationalism is tempting, but it will fail to transform the world. What it unintentionally does is make the gospel secondary. The main focus is on preserving a nation and its borders. The Christian nation must be protected at all costs, so we Christians can thrive within our borders. It becomes a mission to protect the land, not one where land and property can be surrendered if it means the gospel will spread to more hearts. Values are stripped from Christianity and are used as a means to an end, which is to protect the nation and the territory at all costs, whether through war, hate, or even authoritarianism. But Jesus did not call us to protect a nation or land, but be willing to sell everything we have to follow Him. We are called to count all we have earned as lost for the sake of Christ. Christian nationalism is national self-worship disguised as Christianity. A nation of Christian nationalists is not a nation of Christians. Sadly, the Christian nationalist has misused the gospel. Christianity does not necessarily need cultural or political power. The church is not one that needs a Christian nation in order to thrive. It will thrive regardless of the political powers that be, and regardless of the culture. Tertullian said the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the new church. Christianity often grows when Christians are persecuted. We do not need to get a hold of the culture first. We can spread the gospel regardless of who is in power. And often when Christians have political power, we become too comfortable. We have become blessed with powerful nations meant to be used as tools for the kingdom. But instead the nations become our idols, and Christianity becomes the tool, something to be used to protect our borders and enforce our way of life. We want a Christian nation, not because we think it will help Jesus in the goal of evangelizing the world, but because we want to be rich, safe, and powerful within our own borders. I'm not saying Christians can never engage in politics or culture wars but they must be put in their proper place. They must always be secondary to the spreading of the gospel. Because this is what will truly transform people to think with the mind of Christ. Christianity cannot be used to build what we want. It has become a tool for the political left and the right to enforce a specific culture or political system with the goal of comfort for Christians. But this is not what Jesus intended. He set the example that we are to follow by resisting the temptation to take the easy way. He began his kingdom with 12 ordinary men from Galilee. He taught them, loved them as brothers, and trained them to do likewise. He was persecuted, experienced anger, sadness, and suffered immensely on our behalf. But he never said the goal was to get political power so he could make his life easier. His focus was always on the people and calling all to him. His values could not be enforced with a sword, but must come from the heart. When Jesus was on the temple, he was offered his chosen people without even having to bow to Satan. He longed to gather his children to be used for the good of humanity, but they were not willing, and forcing them to believe with an undeniable miracle would not create the transformed people he wanted. Satan told Jesus to be sure the Father loved him by jumping over the edge so he would see God protect him from death. But Jesus knew God's love meant he had to die. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Satan foolishly thought being saved from death would be the loving thing for God to do. But Jesus knew his death would be the greatest act of love God has ever shown. It is likely when Jesus was atop the temple, he could see off in the distance Golgotha, the place where he would be crucified. Before him, he could see two options, take the easy road. Throw yourself down, and Israel will accept you as king, or refuse and follow the plan of the Father. Israel will reject you. They will condemn you to die at the hands of the Gentiles. But Jesus didn't take the road of comfort. He took the road of suffering. For you. He didn't desire mere power over you, but gave it up so he could transform you by the renewing of your mind. He was stripped, beaten, nailed to a cross, and died to take the penalty for your sins. 
He went to the cross to transform you, not to enslave you. And then he was buried with your sins. But the grave could not hold him. And when he rose, he didn't appear to Pilate, the Sanhedrin, or anyone to gloat over and demonstrate his power. He went to those he knew he could transform with love. Because the gospel has always been about love. Our king set the example by surrendering all for us, laying his life down, and through it all, loving those who killed him. This idea cannot be weaponized to build a preferred culture or government and vilify those who reject it. It is an idea that can only lead to loving your enemies. When we try to use Christianity to build a nation for our own benefit, instead of sacrificing all to transform hearts, we will always fail. Christianity cannot be something it was never designed to be. The gospel is a story of suffering, one where we give all for our king who died for us. You cannot use Christianity for your own gain. It will not work that way. Let us not focus on building a nation for us, but giving our nation for the good of the gospel. Be willing to give all for Christ, and then you will know the true heart of God and a peace that passes all understanding. Set above all else his plan. Play your part in it, and he assures us in the end, he will make everything right.